Here in the last part of our ecology unit, we're going to focus in on ecosystems. The key word there, or the key part of that being systems. The ecosystem is all the organisms living in a given area, along with the abiotic factors with which they interact. It's a community and its physical environment. Now, in part one of this video, we're going to look at the energy exchange throughout an ecosystem. And in part two, we'll look at the nutrient exchange. So energy exchange in an ecosystem, what does that mean? Well, the first thing we have to understand is that energy flows through an ecosystem. Let me bring this to the front. The energy in this case is going to flow from the sun, from the sun into the phytoplankton, the photosynthetic organisms or the plants. And then those organisms are going to get eaten by other organisms, and the sunlight energy that's been bound in the chemical bonds of these organisms will now become bound in the bonds of these organisms. And then this fish eats those microscopic plankton, and then this turtle eats the fish, and the energy is flowing in this direction. Now, at each transfer, we're going to lose energy as heat at every one of these transfers. We're also going to lose energy in the in due to the energy spent through just living, through respiring and keeping the body alive. But the energy that goes through the system never gets back to the sun. It just doesn't happen. Energy f flows. It does not cycle. Now let's look at the kind of uh, stages that the energy goes, how it flows through a, a ecosystem. We need to look at the feeding structure of that ecosystem. We call that the trophic levels or the position in the food chain. We start with our primary producers, those organisms which have the ability to take energy from the sun and convert it into organic matter and create biomass from that energy. Photos like plants and photosynthetic algae or even the photosynthetic bacteria are able to trap sunlight energy into chemical bond energy, so we call them producers. They're step one in our food chain and the first stop for the energy in flowing through the system. From the primary producers, we go to the primary consumers, the herbivores, those organisms which eat that um, organic matter, the, the plant matter. They're going to take that energy that's trapped in the grass in this case, and as they digest it, and consume it, and convert it, use it to who, uh, drive their own um, metabolic um, needs and also to build more structure, to build more cow or more rabbit. So they're primary consumers. If this mountain lion eats that rabbit or you eat that cow in your hamburger, then you are a secondary consumer, a carnivore that eats an herbivore. Then if you are unfortunate enough to be eaten by this lion, or unfortunate enough to be this seal which eats fish and is now being eaten by this shark, the shark and the lion would represent a tertiary consumer, carnivores that eat other carnivores. But in the end, we all end up in the same place, and that's at uh, the decomposers. The detritivores, saprobes, decomposers, fairly interchangeable terms. These are organisms that live on uh, dead and decaying organic matter. So the energy flows from the sun to the primary producers into the primary consumers, secondary consumers, possibly tertiary consumers, and eventually to the decomposers. Now, the energy flows. It doesn't get back to the sun, so where does it end up? Each step along the way these uh, energy transfers are going to let me pick this this one. These energy transfers are going to be um, inefficient, meaning as we move the energy from the plant to the herbivore, we're going to lose energy as heat. Furthermore, all the energy that's consumed by this cricket is not necessarily available or isn't available for this mouse that's eating the cricket because the cricket's going to have used some of that energy uh, during its respiration just to power its activities not necessarily in order to make more cricket so by the time we get to the mouse there's less energy uh, due to loss from heat and also the energy consumed in respiration which eventually is also released as heat
So at each step of the way, we're losing energy from this system. Now we know that energy is not destroyed, it just changes forms, but it's not in a form that we can use anymore. So energy is flowing through the system. Well, we look at it this way, and it seems like a very linear type of arrangement, but in fact, uh, in ecosystems, food webs are more likely than food chains, where we have some branches, and uh, an organism can occupy more than one level on the, on the trophic levels. For example, when you eat a hamburger with lettuce, you are both a primary consumer for eating the lettuce and a secondary consumer in eating the beef. Now, due to the fact that each time we transfer energy, it's an inefficient transfer, um, we have less energy available at each trophic level. That actually impacts the amount of biomass or new organic material that can be made at each level. It also, therefore, impacts the number of individuals in the next trophic level. And we end up getting these pyramids, these ecological pyramids, as we look at productivity. So we need to define productivity. Productivity is the rate of the generation of biomass. In other words, how much of the hamburger that you eat is used to make more of you, more organic material. And when a cow eats grass, how much of the energy from the grass ends up being available to you as the consumer of the cow? Well, we have two terms, the gross productivity, but more importantly, uh, the important term, the net productivity. The net productivity is the amount of energy trapped in organic matter during a specified interval less that lost by respiration of the organism at that level. It's better shown by an illustration. Here's excuse me, a caterpillar. If I can move this a minute. Let's make this bigger. And if this caterpillar is eating a leaf, and let's say that it consumes 200 joules worth of energy from that leaf, how many joules are available to the uh, bird that might eat this caterpillar? Well, a lot of that material is not digested, and, is and that energy is still behind, left behind in the feces, so we didn't get to that energy. And so, and some of it is used to grow new caterpillar, and some of it is spent energy during cellular respiration. So the gross productivity would include these two numbers. You know, in this case, 100 joules was taken in, but only 33 joules is our gross productivity what's available, I'm sorry, the net productivity, what's available if, for instance, a bird were to, have, were to eat this caterpillar. Let's look at the impact of this, this through an entire system. Let me make this bigger. So we have this much energy coming in at the bottom level with the producers. Okay. Of that energy, only this small portion is available for the next trophic level. In other words, the plants take in uh, this quantity, but the cows and the rabbits only have available this much because this part in blue is lost through respiration. Only this much is incorporated, the purple part is incorporated into the system and available for the next level. So the next level gets this much, but only makes available to the subsequent level this much, and so the next level, only the net productivity is less and less. So at each level as we move up, the net productivity, the amount of energy that's converted into biomass that's available for the next feeding level, gets less and less and less. Therefore, we can support less and less organisms as we move up the trophic levels. What that creates are some pyramids uh, in, ec in ecology. Uh, we have pyramids of biomass. Let's look at this pyramid of biomass, well, then we'll look at this. We'll look at the productivity first. The pyramid of productivity, the primary conducer, producers are producing, uh, you know, capturing maybe a thousand joules, and the next level is only capturing and in, in, in producing a hundred joules, and then ten. And you can see we have about a um, only about a ten percent transfer at each level. So if we look at total biomass, amount of organic material at each level. Uh, in this case, this graph showing 9,000 kilocalories per square meter per year available for the primary consumers. So these trees and shrubs and grasses are producing 9,000 kilocalories per square meter available to the primary consumers. The primary consumers consume that 9,000 kilocalories but only make available 900 of it for the secondary consumers available to the next level. 
and then 90, and then 9. And you can see that there's less and less biomass at each level, which means it can sustain less and less numbers. So let's look at a pyramid of numbers. Uh, for example, it takes 10,000 freshwater shrimp to feed 1,000 bleak. Not sure what a bleak is, and 1,000 bleak uh, is enough to feed 100 perch, which can feed 10 northern pike, which feeds one osprey. So essentially, the one osprey has also consumed the 10,000 freshwater shrimp. Um, and so each level, we have less numbers. And some interesting things happen here. Uh, here we have a pyramid of biomass. The elder tree, a tree has a very large mass. Uh, can sustain a large mass of aphids, which are then fed on by lacewings, and there's less weight, weight, um, lacewings, which are fed on by starlings, and the biomass pyramid uh, is a normal shaped pyramid. But when we look at our pyramid of numbers, something interesting happens here, because one tree can sustain many, many aphids, but they can sustain less lacewings, which can sustain less starling. And here's a traditional pyramid of numbers, um, lettuce, uh, feeding snails, feeding thrushes, feeding sparrowhawks. We'd have less sparrowhawks than thrushes, less um, thrushes than snails, and less snails than lettuce plants. This comparison down here at the bottom uh, is because we can see kind of in one uh, comparison uh, the difference between um, biomass and numbers. Um, so as we move up in biomass, there's less and less biomass in grams of, of organic matter per square meter. Um, and you can see how it also affects that we'd, in, in any type of system, we'd have a biomass of numbers so that many, many, many producers can only sustain less primary consumers, less secondary consumers, and less tertiary consumers. And now I'm getting repetitive. Uh, let's look at one of the pyramid that's inverted. How about the biological amplification of a toxin? If you apply neglect here and release some toxin into the environment, well, maybe a little a, a little bit of toxin gets into a lot of grass. So each blade of grass doesn't have a lot of toxins, but a mouse or a rabbit or a cow, a cow may not be a good example, they're going to eat a lot of that grass. And so those toxins are going to accumulate. And then if snakes eat a lot of those mice, then that same amount of toxin across all that grass is getting amplified into less and less individuals because the number of individuals as we move up here, uh, as we move up, we're getting less numbers of individuals, but the same amount of toxins. So the toxins are being concentrated into a fewer number of individuals. And finally, we can compare the productivity of different biomes. And we can look at this chart and see uh, and make sure we're doing a little graph reading properly. The net primary productivity in kilocalories per meter squared per year. And we can see that estuaries, swamps, marshes, tropical rainforests have a higher rate of uh, a net primary productivity. They're producing a lot uh, per square meter. So we can see the different uh, biomes and how they, how they score on this. But let's bring in another graph real quick. So here's a little uh, uh, testing your ability to read charts and graphs. Over here, in this one, uh, bring it to the front, uh, we see that um, the open oceans uh, score pretty low. But when we look at this chart, we see the open ocean being at the top. So what's going on here? Well, if we look carefully and pay real close attention, this is kilocalories per meter squared per year. Well, in every square meter of open ocean, there may not be a lot of productivity. However, if we look at that productivity in just kilocalories per year for getting net, um, square meters, the open ocean produces much more because there's so many square meters of ocean. So there's a look at how energy moves through a system. Uh, and in the second part of this video, we will look at how nutrients cycle. So come back for part two.